Welcome to another episode of Should You Take That Case with your host, Lisa Wade, your friendly neighborhood legal nurse consultant, owner of Wade Nurse Consultants, and creator of our private LinkedIn community, the Attorney Medical Record Resource Group. That is where we get all of our stellar attorney guests. The goal of our show is to be a resource for legal professionals who pursue medical cases by sharing their experience and insights as defense or as plaintiff attorneys. You can catch prior episodes at www.wadenurseconsultants.com slash blog on LinkedIn and on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and more. Now here's the host of Should You Take That Case, Lisa Wade. Hey there, everyone. It's another Medical Record Monday, and welcome to a brand new episode of Should You Take That Case? It is me, your host, Lisa Wade, friendly neighborhood legal nurse consultant, medical record expert, and owner of Wade Nurse Consultants. Think of us when you have those tons of medical records that you need translated into normal human language, easily understood by judges and juries. Well, oh, and visit us at our newly established website, wadenurseconsultants.com. Tell us what you think of that. I'd appreciate it. Now, I am also the creator of another little group here, the Attorney Medical Record Resource Group. That's where we get all of our wonderful attorney guests. And we use this as an opportunity to get to know one another. And we're going to do that today or do this again today with Jeffrey Gross from Philadelphia. But before we get Jeffrey out here, we are going to scoot over to the comment section, see if anybody's visiting us live today. Please put an A into that chat if you are an attorney, a P if you're a paralegal, but put a W if you're part of a wonderful group that I am a part of, Women Owned Law. It is a groundbreaking group connecting and advancing women legal entrepreneurs, but with the primary mission of empowering women attorneys to achieve success in the business of law. Save the date for April 18th and 19th this year for our symposium in Philadelphia at the Thomas R. Klein Institute of Trial Advocacy at 12th and Chestnut. Well, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that maybe later towards the end of our show today. Get on over to womenownedlaw.org to learn a little bit more. And uh, now I want to tell everybody, thank you all. If you're catching us live or on the replay, thank you for taking time out of your very busy days to watch us and be with us. And now it's time to bring out our attorney guest for a repeat appearance. I'm going to bring out Jeffrey Gross. There you are, Jeffrey. Hi, how's it going? Hey, Lisa, how are you? Oh, I'm well, I'm well. Well, we have the same skyline, the same, uh, the same weather out there because I'm just outside of Philadelphia, so... I know what I don't have to ask you that today, but that's true. We talked about that and it is getting dark. So I don't know what you can see, but uh, it's getting it's... darker later, which is even better than it has been. The later uh... it gets darker, the better I feel. Oh, I like that. All right. That's good. That's good. Well, I'm so glad you are with us for a repeat appearance. So Tell everybody that is watching, tell them a little bit about yourself. Do your own little introduction. We want to hear all about you. You got it. So my name is Jeffrey Gross. I've been practicing law for about 33 years since uh, 1991. And I handle exclusively workers' compensation claims on behalf of the injured worker. So I represent people who've been involved in work-related injuries who unfortunately are unable to perform their 
positions, their jobs, and uh, require significant medical medical attention. And I've been doing that for basically my entire career. And I love what I do because it really, really um, it helps the little guy, which is what I've been trained to do since I was a little kid. Uh, my hero in my life was my grandfather, who was an assembly line worker for uh, Bond Bread, which was a local bread manufacturing company here in Philadelphia. And my grandfather would give you the shirt off of his back. And he always had a saying, if you can help somebody, why wouldn't you? And so he instilled that in me. And when I graduated law school, he told me a story about a woman who in 1953 was on an assembly line and had long hair like most women did back in, 19, in the 1950s and was not wearing a hairnet. And her hair got caught up in the assembly line process, causing her scalp to be ripped off in a very violent fashion. And of course, you can imagine what that scene looked like. So my grandfather, who was the foreman of the line, shut down the, the process, ran to her. She was screaming Bloody Mary. And he grabbed her scalp and he grabbed her and he hightailed it to his car and put her in his Buick, I think it was, and drove her to the hospital, waited with her for five hours while they basically sewed her scalp back on all bloody shirt, um, got her a teddy bear, got her flowers. And once he knew she was okay, he left the hospital, went to the plant. It was still there. It was still during the day. And he said, we have to help her. She's really in bad shape. And would you believe it? The response was, we're not helping her. She wasn't wearing her hairnet. And therefore, we don't owe her anything. He was appalled by that. He told me the story. And unfortunately, in 1953, she was basically powerless to do anything on her own and never was able to go back to work. They fired her. They, she never returned to work there. She was humiliated. She had a lifelong problem from what happened to her, both emotionally and physically. Didn't do anything about it. And he said to me, when I graduated law school, you can do anything you want, but you should look after the little guy. The little guy needs your help. And that really hit me hard. And little, little did I know that I would be getting a case that fell in my lap later that year from my mentor, who was, my, was the partner at the firm that I worked at at the time. And he said, what do you know about workers' compensation? Nothing. He said, here, here are three volumes of the statutes in Pennsylvania that govern workers' compensation law. Go home over the weekend and read them. And then on Monday, we have a new client coming in and you can run with the client. Well, I went home, read my books, and I was ready. I came back. I met this poor guy and his family. He had been an over-the-road truck driver to, that was delivering beer from Golden, Colorado to New York City. He happened to live in um, Chestnut Hill. And when he was on Route 80 in Pennsylvania, he was trying to make it from Colorado to New York in one fell swoop because he got a bonus for getting his load there early. And he had a truck full of beer that he was driving along Route 80, Interstate 80, and uh, unfortunately, because he was overdoing it, he dozed off, fell asleep at the wheel, went over an embankment, lost the entire payload of the, tra of the trailer, and he was in really bad shape. He was in such bad shape that they airlifted him to a hospital here in Philadelphia where they performed all kinds of surgery on him to, to save his life and to, to improve him to the best that he could be before he could start with therapy. And they denied his claim. And they said, you're not getting a dime. You ruined the entire load of the truck because you decided you wanted to take a nap, which clearly was not the case. They were trying to incentivize him 
mm-hmm. by giving him a bonus if he would or would make it back back to New York on time. And so he was in Pennsylvania. The jurisdiction was Pennsylvania. I knew what I knew from the weekend, and I knew what I knew from the law. And I said, I got you. And I filed a claim, and we litigated the claim. And at the end of the year, it took about a year to, to win his case. I won everything I asked for. They were so happy, his family, that they came into the office with a big tray of cookies. And his wife was teary-eyed. He was so grateful, and that's when I knew that's what my grandfather would have wanted. And by the way, I didn't tell you this part, but he had passed about a month before this case was won. Mm. And so I was, I was, I thought of it as a sign that he helped me win this case from up there. Mm-hmm. And I, I really, really went to town with this. And I said, this is what I want to do. And it's what I do now exclusively, 100%. And I love it. I help people every day. And so if you have an an injury that happens at work, you can call me. I will talk to you personally. I will listen to you and see if you have a claim and and help you the best I can. Mm -hmm. I have a great track record, knock on wood. Well, it sounds like you are the person to have in in my corner if I have a a workplace injury. That's very nice of you, Lisa. (laughs) Well, the last time you were here, we talked about what what I always talk about, how medical records come up in in cases uh, like this. But we want to know now, you know, what's been going on? Tell me a few changes, three changes, well, a few changes that have happened to you personally or professionally since you were here last year. Let's talk about some professional changes. Okay. My firm has grown. One of my lawyers became a judge, and I just hired a new one, and I'm very happy about that. I'm very proud of my lawyer who became a judge. Her name is Casey Pochettino, and she is an, a workers' compensation judge now. And I'm very, very proud of her. Um, I can tell you there's been some trends in the law. Would you like me to tell you a little bit about that? Oh, please. (laughs) So in the workers' compensation arena, that is people who get hurt at work, there are a lot of people who recreationally smoke marijuana, have those gummies that that they like, and have accidents. Not necessarily because they're taking drugs but it just so happens that there's more and more people doing that and there's more and more well there's there's accidents as you know at work one of the things that the insurance companies are trying to do is to look at those cases and screen everyone for drug toxicity to see if they're basically um intoxicated so to speak as a result of that or other drugs in their system and trying to deny the claims on those bases and it's it's in the law that if you are intoxicated with an illicit drug and you get into a work-related injury the defense can exist that if that were the cause of the injury they're not responsible for that injury it's an exception to the no-fault rule in Pennsylvania, where it doesn't matter whose fault it is, if you get hurt at work, you're covered by workers' compensation. That's an exception that says that if you are injured at work and the injury, while, while you had this injury, you had blood level toxicity in your in your system because of drugs or alcohol that are that would have caused an impairment, and therefore could have substantially contributed to this accident that you can be forever barred from bringing a claim. Mm. It's a very interesting defense. A part of the problem that I have with that defense is that there are a lot of people who are on prescription medications that are looked upon as an opioid class or something that can alter your perception or judgment. Mm. And so, if you're on, if you do have a problem like a lower back issue and you're taking medication for it and you get into an accident at work and they do a drug screen that can show up and they can start playing with that. Mm-hmm. 
Mm. So it's, it's, it's wise to tell our audience about these kinds of things to educate them so that they're aware of what their limitations are if they're on medication or taking illicit drugs or drinking alcohol. But one of the things I've learned, and you, would, you could probably be used for this purpose, Lisa, mm -hmm. is that if there are medical records that show a blood level toxicity in your blood or the presence of alcohol or the presence of some kind of drug, which lasts in your system for many days, mm. you know, maybe not alcohol, alcohol probably a day or two, but marijuana, other drugs can last in your system for a long time. And because they last in your system, doesn't necessarily mean that you're intoxicated at the time of the accident. You could have had them on, you could have been doing some fun stuff on Saturday night that on Monday you're perfectly fine, but you have an accident at work. What is the defense? The defense is, well, look at these medical records. They show that in his system were marijuana, was marijuana. Well, what they have to show besides just being in your system is that it was a substantial contributing factor towards the accident. The only way they can prove that is if they have the toxicity levels. And one of the things that I'm sure, Lisa, that you're good at doing is looking at the records to determine whether they're just in this person's system or whether they're rising to the level of a, of a toxicity to show that, that they're in the system and causing uh, inebriation. And I can say that 90% of the time, they, when they do a drug screen, they do a drug screen for the presence of these substances. They don't do a drug screen necessarily to determine the level of the presence of this uh, substance. And they therefore cannot prove many times that these substances were to such a level that impaired this person and that substantially therefore caused the work injury. Hmm. So tying your medical records theme into a work-related injury, that's a very, very good thing for you to have the ability to do. Read through medical records and see whether they're just in this person's system or whether they're in this person's system and rise to the level of toxicity or inebriation based upon the amounts shown. Mm -hmm. Again, if they're just in the presence of this person's system, doesn't mean that they're intoxicated because they last, they last for 17 days from what I understand in certain circumstances. Hmm. Well, yeah, I, definitely. Looking at lab values is a big part of, of, of reviewing medical records and, you know, getting those details for you that can help you uh, or help people understand just because a certain level it, uh, uh, might be in somebody's blood at one time. That doesn't mean at the time that this was happening or the time of the injury that that's what was going on. So. Yeah, I'm glad that you are diving into that and uh, yeah. being an advocate for your clients to to get the word out. So that is excellent. Well, uh, I know, I know what keeps you involved and interested in in your practice. You you've told us a lot, and uh, your your family history and your grandfather that is a big part of it. And uh, I know that. What keeps you intrigued about it? What what else do you find interesting that keeps you in this line of practice? You know what keeps me going? It, what keeps me going and doing this is seeing that people who can't help themselves because they don't have the wherewithal to help themselves, they're not lawyers, mm -hmm. they're not versed in the system, they don't know what's necessary, they don't know what buttons to push to get them to where they need to have the, the, the benefits of the workers' compensation system. When people don't have the tools that they need to succeed, and I can come in and help them and get the cookies off the shelf, so to speak, to provide them to my clients, that is the most satisfying thing that you can ever imagine. 
to be able to do something to help another person who can't help him or herself is something that is not only it doesn't it, it makes me feel fulfilled it gives me a sense of purpose um, in my life that i'm helping another person do be in a better place than he or she was without my existence mm -hmm. and that's what that's what keeps me going Aww. every once in a while you get an ungrateful person who doesn't appreciate that but those are few and far between the frustrations of the system are taxing on a person like me or any other lawyer. The frustrations of being able to put together a circus act, so to speak, to have everything line up so that everything works well is not an easy task. But when it's done and it's, and it's looked upon in retrospect and my clients appreciate it, it's worthwhile. Oh, that is wonderful. You sound like a wonderful justice warrior. <laughs> Thank you. Well, um, let's get down to, I, I know we are all coming out of this, uh, this shutdown, this pandemic. <laughs> Do you have any advice or anything that you've learned over the past uh, couple of years that has changed the way that you run your practice? Anything Absolutely. like that? Absolutely. A workers' compensation practice, like any other law practice, is fluid. There's no such thing as this is the way it is and it doesn't change. It's constantly changing. Whether it's changing from a legislative standpoint, whether it's changing from a demographic per, uh, standpoint for practicing, or whether there's a pandemic on 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 the heels of your of your practice this these these this work is constantly changing when we had the pandemic and we were unable to physically appear in court we were unable to go and meet our clients because you you don't want to get sick and you didn't want to get them sick mm -hmm. it became very very difficult and almost panic stricken uh was the best is the best word to to put the way I felt in the very beginning. I made the mistake of watching a movie called um, Contagion. Have you seen it? <laughs> yes, I have. And I watched it, believe it or not, just after this pandemic started. So this kind of unfolded in March and I had some extra time on my hands because of it. And in the middle of March or end of March, I don't know, I saw this thing contagion it kept showing up on netflix or wherever it was and i and i just started watching it and i was intrigued by the parallels between that movie which was made in 2012 and what was actually going on this current day in 2020 and so it made me panicked because that had much more severe consequences to to the pandemic than what happened here we were shut down we had problems but they didn't lose government functioning and they didn't lose certain services like the trash system, the trash collection was, was ceased to exist. There were no more groceries on the shelves of the grocery stores. People took it upon themselves to rob other people with guns at, in their homes in order to steal their groceries. Didn't get that bad, but it did get bad. Mm -hmm. And when you're in a practice that's constantly going like this, and then all of a sudden you can't meet with people, you can't show up in court, what do we do? So we used the electronic system uh, and emails and certain platforms that exist for case management, such as case management software, in order to help ourselves. And we enacted this emergency procedure where there were no more live hearings, but everything was done virtual kind of like what we're doing here. And what we did was we would sign up cases by DocuSign, which is a, or one of those platforms, which requires an electronic signature. And I would FaceTime with my clients and, and have the, the documents emailed to them where all they would need to do would be to click on them to affix their signature. It would come back to me and I would be able to get records electronically from the Bureau of Workers' Compensation. 
and I'd be able to file the doc the the claims that I needed, the petitions that were required, all by electronic means, and I was able to appear in court electronically, virtually, through the platform of Microsoft Teams, and they changed the procedure globally in the state of Pennsylvania, at least, for purposes of appearing in court, conducting depositions, conducting medical expert depositions, getting medical records, and so forth and so on. And it became an easier way to do things. You would think that it would slow everything up to the point where we were powerless at a standstill. Justice could not be done, but it was not the case. We were able to turn that negativity into not only making it work and, and becoming somewhat positive, but thriving because mm -hmm. I didn't have to waste my time going to see a client or having them having to come in and see me. They were comfortable in, in their own homes talking to me either by phone or by FaceTime or some other platform like Zoom. Mm -hmm. And they would sign the documentation as I would go over them, I'll go over it with them, It'd save a lot of time. I didn't have to go travel to different areas in the to the courts. Everything could have been could be done virtually. <clears throat> and the most interesting thing that occurred is that I am local to Philly, as you know. So my practice consisted of a Philadelphia based practice where I would also go out to Montgomery County, to Bucks County, to Delaware County, maybe get out into Lehigh County maybe get out into Dauphin County, some, some of those outlying counties. Every once in a while, I would go out there. But during the pandemic, and because of the internet, I was able to sign clients up who were seeking my help from all over the state. And because of that, I could go to places that I'd never go to. I could go to Erie. I could go to Pittsburgh. I could go to Scranton. Mm -hmm. And I could go to these outlying places that were too far for these people to come into Philly in the first place and too far for them to go anywhere even locally to them. So if a person lived in the middle of the woods in Pennsylvania, maybe near Altoona, but not near Altoona, but in the middle of nowhere, they could use their internet to find me and I could help them. And I could proceed by making a claim in the county in which they lived. And I could proceed by appearing virtually in front of that judge there. And it kind of expanded and became a very rewarding practice, not only for me, but for my clients, because they had more access to justice that way. Mm. And so the key is access to justice and making it work. So what took a long time in the past became very easy to be done by virtually. And so when we had a, an agreement, for instance, instead of making my client travel to a courthouse or appear live anywhere, it could all be done virtually. And it became a lot easier, faster. The agreements were getting done like that. And I was able to review them the way I could review them before have everything signed and sealed and delivered. I could settle a case today for a hearing that exists tomorrow, the next day, and no problem. Whereas before, we would have to have them come in, go over everything with them, send it back to the other lawyer. I mean, it, as the electronic age has developed, the ease of this practice has been much more accessible by my clients. And I'm, I'm very grateful for that. As a, as a silver lining to the hardship that everybody has faced with this pandemic, we came out of it on, on, on the good side. We came out of it in a way where people are used to that now. And so if you look at the new, the new cases that I have, they don't want to come in. They don't want to go to the courthouse. <laughs> They're fine doing it from their couch. And guess what? It just works out. Yeah. So. I 
I like it. I like it. It it yeah. it sounds like it's been an opportunity for you to step up your technology game <laughs> at your firm and an opportunity to expand your client base. It's that sounds good. The one thing I've learned is that you do have to shift with the paradigm, meaning every time something changes dramatically, you have a choice. You can either say, no, I can't take this. Or you approach it and you conquer it. You find out a way, you figure it out and you succeed. And the more tenacious you are, the more you continuously try and try and try. You might fail several times, but the more you try and apply yourself and figure out a way, it works. Every problem has a solution, something that my grandfather always used to say, but he never said every problem has a solution. He said, Jeffy, he used to call me Jeffy. He said, if there's a problem, you'll fix it. You'll figure out a way. And then you, you do, you figure out a way. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad we came out on, on the positive side of things following the pandemic. And I'm hoping your audience is doing well and that uh, you know we're, they're able to persevere. Well, I'm so glad that you're here today sharing all of your insights and your knowledge and what you have learned over the past few years. It's it's wonderful. And speaking of the audience, it's time for a little Q&A. If you are ready for them to ask you whatever questions are on their mind, are you ready to answer some questions? I would be honored to. Excellent. Excellent. Well, while everybody is out there getting ready to ask your questions and funnel them into the comments section. It's time for what we call here a little sponsor break. So let me tell you really quick, a little bit about Wade Nurse Consultants, and then we get right back to Jeffrey Gross. Now, without a review and summary of medical records, it could be harder for you personal injury and med mal attorneys or workers' comp attorneys out there to know if you should take that case. And here at Wade Nurse Consultants, we give attorneys a one to two page synopsis and opinion regarding merits of medical cases. We also locate experts. We also attend DMEs or um, IMEs, whatever is appropriate. <laughs> But um, over here, we use uh, my 30 plus years of nursing experience to work on those workers' comp and medical record reviews. So if you are watching this and you already have your own nurse paralegal on the payroll, this isn't for you. So, but if you have medical records that you need to be attacked, and uh, so you can focus on your legal strategies. Here's what you do. Right now, we are offering a free 20-minute medical record strategy call to help you hone an efficient and timely and cost-effective routine around those medical record reviews. So inside of the description box of this YouTube channel, you will find a link to schedule that free consultation. And now let's get back to Jeffrey. Let's see, Jeffrey. Do we have any questions yet? Not yet. So that's okay. The, well, that happens. That happens. Of course. <laughs> People are eating dinner. People are eating dinner. And sometimes they catch us on the replay. They could be on the train. So right now. That's true. But I have a plan for that. I have put your contact information in the description box of this YouTube channel and people can reach out to you whenever they're finished dinner or back home <laughs> off the train and ask you those questions themselves. Does that sound like a plan? Sounds like a plan. I'm happy to answer anybody's question. Oh, wonderful. So I think we're kind of wrapping up right now and, uh, I just want to thank you again for coming. And uh, I do have a question. Are you, will you come back again if I invite you again? I, Lisa, I would be honored to, to be part of this program. I think it's a great thing that you're doing. And you, you provide a very good service. And people should use you, including me. So that's why I want something 
in front of me that every time I need medical records reviewed, I can I know I can call you. All right. I might deliver that personally. You'll never know. I'll come say hello. Uh, <laughs> if you deliver it personally, I might just buy you lunch. Oh, you never oh. know. Well, don't threaten me with a good time. So there you go. All right. Well, I think, like I said, we are winding up for this episode. But let me give a little information real quick. Uh, Women-owned law. I told you we are having a symposium, our third annual, April 19th, 18th and 19th. So anybody out there um, want to uh, get to our symposium and here's some hard hitting topics like tipping the scale, growing your firm, uh, making an impact uh, with diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's not just for big law firms. Come on over and sign up at womenownedlaw.org to come to our symposium. But if you are looking to get on board as a sponsor for our symposium, that's wonderful too. If you want to get your a company in front of our vibrant women-owned law community, consider the sponsorship package. Again, visit us at womenownedlaw.org. Now some quick reminders to like and subscribe to this YouTube channel. To email me if you have any legal nurse Thanks for watching and listening to another episode of Should You Take That Case with your host, Lisa Wade, your friendly neighborhood legal nurse consultant, owner of Wade Nurse Consultants, and creator of our private LinkedIn community, the Attorney Medical Record Resource Group. That is where we get all of our stellar attorney guests. The goal of our show is to be a resource for legal professionals who pursue medical cases by sharing their experiences and insights as defense or as plaintiff attorneys. You can catch prior episodes at www.wavenurseconsultants.com slash blog, on LinkedIn, and on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and more. Thank you for subscribing to our YouTube channel and sharing this show with others. 